Uh, today's topic is on social media and the growing threat to minors. The format will be, I'll give a few introductory remarks. I'll read uh, panel uh, biographies. We'll go into about uh, 45 minutes or so of moderated discussion, and we'll leave the remaining time at the end uh, for audience Q&A. Uh, my name is Zach Whiting. I'm the policy director and senior fellow for Better Tech for Tomorrow, which is a uh, technology policy initiative of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And so we engage in research and commentary uh, on issues in uh, technology, culture, and public policy. And uh, the sort of the motto uh, that we live by is that technology is a tool. It can be used for, for good or for bad. And uh, we want to emphasize the good and, and uh, responsibly limit the bad where we can. And uh, this session, uh, my colleague uh, David Dunmoyer is our campaign director. We're primarily focused on three issues, data privacy, uh, keeping kids safe online and, and other online safety measures, and then broadband. So uh, tune in for, uh, tune in for the, the panel on broadband at 5 o'clock this afternoon. There won't be one. We won't be here. Um, so uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, today's uh, topic is, is online safety and the, the growing threat to minors. And kind of just framing it big picture, we have reached this sort of international level of ubiquity in smartphone use and social media use. There are an estimated 5.27 billion mobile phone users worldwide. That's 67% of the world's population. And 4.48 billion active social media media users, which is approximately 57% of the population. I am not one of them. Uh, modern social media launched in around 2004, but researchers, even by the end of the decade, were recognizing some of the harms linked to social media. And this is a long list, so I'm going to read it. Among the harms that are linked to social media are addiction, depression, anxiety, stress, poor sleep, social and relational problems, body dysmorphia, cyberbullying, crime, human trafficking, child sex abuse, pornography, self-harm, and suicide. Researchers have classified excessive social media use as a behavioral addiction, which shares common characteristics with substance abuse. And the impacts and harms have been particularly acute on children but very, very problematic for teenage girls, very acute on teenage girls. And um, one of our panelists, Representative Patterson, he's been a legislative champion on this issue and for months. Uh, when it wasn't always in vogue, and Claire, you've written about it for a long time, when it wasn't always in vogue, um, but the conversation has started, and as important as anything is the conversation, but we also hope for, for policy action. And, Representative Patterson has written that social media is the pre-1964 cigarette. Once thought to be perfectly safe for users, social media access to minors has led to remarkable rises in self-harm, suicide, and mental health issues. The Texas legislature must act this session to protect kids because thus far, the social media platforms have failed to do so. And our other panelist, Claire Morell, wrote an excellent op-ed last month called The Social Illness. And in it, she said, social media and smartphones have put our country on a dangerous trajectory towards a civilizational crisis. Because of social media, can we, y'all need me? No, no, I didn't. It, it was not calling out. Um, so, uh, so uh, because of social media, teens today don't know how to live in the real world. We are allowing an entire generation to grow up online. They've become dopamine robots relating to each other only behind screens. They don't know how to form real life relationships or confront and cope with real life disappointments and emotions. And screens are neutering kids' natural abilities to be imaginative and creative. We are losing what it means to be human. The stakes are high. And this uh, generational and addictive reality was noted by the speaker yesterday when he said, we are giving children crack cocaine and their brains cannot handle it. It is a whole new world than any of us dealt with back in the day. And I'm 35, it's a whole different world than I dealt with back in the day. Uh, so uh, as mentioned in this panel, we'll discuss the harms, the impact on family and culture, policy approaches and more, and I'll now introduce our panelists. 
State Representative Jared Patterson represents House District 106, which encompasses the eastern portion of Denton County. During his legislative tenure, Representative Patterson has authored and passed initiatives on policy areas such as transportation, public education, elections, and property taxes. During the 87th session, he played a critical role in the passage of legacy reforms, such as the Texas Heartbeat Act and constitutional carry. He has worked diligently to support first responders, eliminate burdensome and unnecessary government relations, and to protect pets. And as a former legislator, that is, is a critically important issue that, that we worked on. Um, uh, Patterson serves on the House Committees on Calendars, Licensing and Administrative Procedures, and Transportation. He also serves on the Texas Cybersecurity Council, so hopefully we'll be able to talk about that in a, in a different setting. And his family resides in Frisco. And Claire Morell is a policy analyst at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, where she leads the Technology and Human Flourishing Project. Prior to joining EPPC, she worked in both, uh, both the White House Counsel's Office and the Department of Justice during the Trump administration, as well as in the private and nonprofit sectors. At the Department of Justice, she worked as an advisor to Attorney General Bill Barr. So uh, to start things out, we'll go into the uh, sort of moderated Q&A portion. We, I, I tried to touch on it during the opening remarks, but I want to I wanna set the table. Claire, I mentioned your op-ed. I mentioned the modern incarnation of social media being 2004, and we're recognizing the harms by the end of the decade. So what are some of these harms, and how are they affecting today's youth? Um, is this on? OK. Well. Uh, Zach, you already set us up so well in your introduction, just mentioning all of those harms that have been shown to be linked now to social media. And so just to summarize, we have a serious public mental health crisis on our hands with this rising generation of teens who have grown up on smartphones and social media. We are now seeing these skyrocketing rates of depression, anxiety, suicide, self-harm, eating disorders, and the list goes on. And so I've summarized the problems with social media as a threefold issue with both, number one, the design of these apps, how they work by algorithms to addict children. They want to maximize their engagement. They make a profit by selling advertisements. And so in order to make a profit, they want children to stay on their platforms as long as possible. They are extracting their time, their attention, and their data, and selling that to advertisers. And so we first have to just recognize that the very nature and design of social media, the business model, is one of extraction and addiction. They are actively trying to addict our kids. And then the second part is that the content on these platforms is actually very harmful to children. So the platforms circulating or the content circulating on social media platforms is often um, illicit. There's a lot of pornography. This is not just on Pornhub. It's on TikTok and Instagram and Twitter. And so there's harmful content circulating and the platforms are doing nothing to take it down. In fact, it would be opposed to their business model because they know that the more more sensational content actually keeps people addicted and engaged on their platforms longer. So the second piece is the content. And the last and final problem is the people who are exploiting these platforms to reach our children. So we now know predators are actively using these apps to reach out to children, to groom them, to sexually exploit them, to traffic them. And then even their peers are um, using these platforms uh, to engage in cyberbullying. And so I think the threefold nature of the problem is the design of the apps, the content that is circulating that they're not incentivized to take down, and then the third is that uh, bad actors, predators, cyberbullies are exploiting them to reach our, ch our children. And so all of those things combined have led to what I stated in that recent op-ed you mentioned. We are on a trajectory toward what I call a civiliza civilizational crisis. And that is that these children are not growing up in the real world, but the digital world. And they're interacting only behind screens. They're not able to also develop this life skills of resiliency, how to cope with real life disappointments, because they're they've been able to just distract themselves away, to be endlessly entertained, and to not develop those skills for how to interact and engage in the real world. And I fear that this will be very destabilizing to marriage in the long run, to their ability to form real life relationships, and then family formation. And we know those are the building blocks of our society. And so that's, that's how I summarize the problem of social media. 
And one of the things we, we talk about in our, our research paper, and it just it struck me here, um, you, you, I'm a parent, we're all parents, and so we approach it from that lens. And from a policy lens, you approach it by you know, research and trying to craft good policy. And so you have to be careful about allowing the sort of you know, personal reality of it to sink in. But um, uh, within the last uh, week or two, there was uh, an incident uh, in the Hayes uh, School District, which is uh, the district that I live in, and more specifically uh, at uh, the Dahlstrom Middle School, which is uh, the middle school that my kids would go to in Buda. And there was a video, I believe, put up on TikTok where there was a series of uh, videos and photos taken of kids with special needs, and they string them together. Um, and uh, the caption is, normal people are better than retards. And I don't use that word lightly, but to just, you know, to, to highlight the reality of that. And you have the impact on those children. You have the impact on the mother who was interviewed. Um, we, having a, a, a special needs son myself, um, my, uh, my wife was able to connect uh, with uh, one of the mothers. Um, so, but the research says there's the impact on the bullied. But there is actually an impact on the bullier. Um, they have uh, impacts down the road, and, and uh, the, the, the bullying's been around, it will be around, but the pervasiveness of it uh, online uh, makes it more widespread and, and uh, happening at all times. Um, Representative Patterson, you've been a strong advocate for keeping kids safe online. You were, uh, you've been the legislative champion. You, you, have, you have committed to uh, filing bills to address these issues. You've filed a lot of bills this session. And I wanted to, uh, to, to uh, uh, give you a chance if you could talk through your bills, talk about why there is a role for the state to act as a matter of public policy, and what is it that makes you so passionate about the issue? Well, thank you. And, and first and foremost, man, um, that story breaks my heart. <laughs> you got me kind of uh, rocking over here. So um, the bottom line is, is that there is no single thing that our children have access to that is more dangerous for their well-being than social media. Period. The end. There is nothing that they have access to legally um, that is more dangerous than social media. And um, it, it kind of came up naturally. I mean, my wife and I had conversations about, you know, not allowing our children to be on social media um, in large part because of some of the bad things that are said about their dad um, online. Um, but that's kind of how it started. But, you know, as we had some things um, occur in society um, and meeting with law enforcement officials, meeting with public school officials, uh, that's really when I determined that, wow, this is a big serious issue you know, for everyone. And we've got to spread the word. Little did I know a little tweet that I would put out uh, last summer would get international headlines about, um, you know, prohibiting social media companies from allowing minors to be users on their products. And I mean, that went all over the world. And that was before the US Surgeon General, and before President Biden, and before Governor DeSantis, and before, you know, all of these things. And um, it, it just hit me as a parent of young children of a 12 year old, a nine year old, an eight year old, of what kind of life that they're going to encounter, you know, having access to this. And so we uh, studied the issue. I had the opportunity, the speaker allowed me to be on the um, interim committee for youth health and safety um, after the Uvalde tragedy and looking at how social media tied into to that tragedy and other uh, mass shootings. Um, and so we did, we filed a series of bills to this and, and I'll get into the bills in a second, but um, people often come up to me and they're, you know, they're talking about parent rights and they're talking about uh, limited government. And, and those are all things that I believe in with everything in my being and everything in my soul. And those are things that I've fought for, you know, trying to remove sexually explicit books from schools and, and limit, uh, you know, some of the things there and, and, and giving more parental rights in the school system. Um, but here's the bottom line on this issue. Parents don't stand a chance against these algorithms, these machine learned algorithms, these uh, social media companies that hire child psychologists to better hook their, their users, and yes, I'm using the same terminology that you would if you were a drug dealer, but to better hook their users onto their product, um, they, held, they hire child psychologists to do that. They, they have these algorithms that get better and more addictive with every single interaction. How long you stay on a video, if you, if you submit that video you know, through Messenger to your friend, 
um, all, all the interactions, even other interactions that you have online, and that's before we even get into the data privacy piece of this, which we all agree that minors cannot enter into contracts legally, uh, yet they enter into user agreements with the social media companies who then harvest their data and use that uh, to sell you know, for advertising dollars. So the issue is so deep and it, and it affects so many different things. Uh, so we filed a number of bills. Um, our first, which is really for a conversation starter, but it was one that I pledged back last summer, is House Bill 896, uh, which is actually a pretty simple bill. And it just says social media companies can't do business with minors. Um, and there's, a, there's an ID requirement associated with it, just as if you went into a liquor store and you're not 21, uh, you know, or if you are 21, they're gonna ask for your ID uh, you know, to be able to be in that establishment. We also filed House Bill 2155, uh, and that is more geared toward uh, the algorithms specifically and how they work. Um, I know that it's a big uphill battle to try to pass a bill that bans minors from social media, but House Bill 2155 actually goes to the root cause or, or the biggest one of the bigger issues um, on social media, and that's these algorithms. And I want to tell you about a Wall Street Journal study briefly. They registered on TikTok as a 13-year-old in this study, a 13-year-old. They were shown 569 videos glorifying drug use, including cocaine and meth. They were shown promotional videos glorifying uh, drug sales uh, and more than 100 videos from accounts recommending paid pornography sites. And that's in TikTok's own platform, setting up a user profile at 13 years old. That's the kind of content that they were shown in this brief study uh, that they conducted. Uh, so that's one bill. Uh, then we've got some bills related to foreign interest. I mentioned TikTok. Um, you know, they're owned by the Chinese, you know, communists. And, um, you know, they're harvesting data, not only data that you interact with TikTok on, but literally everything on your phone, keystrokes, every image that you have saved on your phone, regardless of if you upload it, so on and so forth. And then we have a resolution that I've co-authored with someone uh, um, who is politically the direct opposite of me, um, a liberal Democrat from El Paso who um, is working with me to encourage Congress to act on this issue as well, because we're gonna, we're gonna try to tackle this issue in the state legislature, but really Congress needs to act nationwide to protect all the children in our country. The final thing that I'll say is that I am so proud that Speaker Phelan has made this issue one of his top priorities of the session, uh, taking um, a lot of our work and a lot of other folks' work and their own work from his office, combining that into House Bill 18 uh, that my friend Representative Shelby Slauson is passing. We are working with her to make sure that we have a robust piece of legislation uh, that will protect our youth online uh, from all of the things that we've talked about. So, um, you know, usually I try to smile more on these panels, but this one, it's, it's kind of hard to get there because this is such a serious and such a dangerous topic for our kids. So perfect segue into everybody's favorite institution in the history of the world, Congress. Um, and uh, but there, there, there is a uh, there is a lot happening at the federal level, and there's a lot happening in the Congress in particular. So I wanted to uh, uh, ask our uh, our swamp dweller, Claire, uh, fr fr from DC, if you could talk to us about what's happening at the federal level. There are already laws out there, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, COPPA. There's the interplay with uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which was uh, two cases before the court recently. So what's the status of federal law? What, what are their limitations? And then what are some of the things that Congress is doing on this? And there are actually some good things that Congress is trying to do on this. Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, well, first of all, the current legal regulatory regime is just not capable of protecting kids online today from social media. So the Child Online Privacy Protection Act called COPPA that Zach mentioned was passed in 1998. So that was well before social media. And unfortunately, that law allows companies to collect data on minors as long as they're over the age of 13 without parental consent. And so now we know the business model of social media is data extraction. That's how they perfect these algorithms to keep kids addicted and engaged on their platforms as long as possible. And so it's set the de facto age of social media to 13, which is just extremely young. And that wasn't even the original intent of the law. The original bill actually had it set at 15 and some last minute lobbying efforts resulted in them lowering it to 13. Um, and so there are efforts now 
now to try to raise that age to 16 at least, if not 18, um, just to protect kids from the business model um, of social media, being able to collect data without parental consent. And so that's the first bill is COPPA, and there are efforts now to, to try to reform that. And Senator Hawley even filed his own bill called the Mature Act to just set the age of social media at 16. So there's increasingly federal efforts to try to update these bills. And then the second law that was intended to govern the internet and protect the internet for children is Section 230, which I'm sure some of you or many of you are familiar with that law, which we mostly often hear of it as a liability shield to protect internet platforms from being held liable for third-party content. But it was actually originally part of a broader piece of legislation called the Communications Decency Act, again passed in 1996, well before social media. But it was also meant to be a sword for companies to take down illicit content, content that's harmful to children. And there's a specific list of obscene, lewd, lascivious, violent, excessively harassing content that these companies are empowered to take down. But there's no corresponding stick. It's all carrot and no stick. And these companies have not been incentivized to take this type of content down because it actually keeps um, users engaged longer on their platform. And so um, we definitely are seeing more efforts to update Section 230. When I was working for Attorney General Barr, one of the provisions he really recommended that Congress consider would be a bad Samaritan carve out that if a company is knowingly facilitating and distributing and hosting content harmful to children, obscene content like pornography, then they should not get the protections of Section 230 immunity for knowingly distributing that content. So there are efforts like that underway. The most promising bill in the near term is the, called the Kids Online Safety Act, COSA. It's a bipartisan bill. And now it doesn't accomplish everything. I think that this room uh, would desire, but it would certainly enact some stronger parental uh, safeguards that would be automatically in place for minor accounts. And so in the near term, I do actually think that that bill has a really good chance of passing this Congress and even being signed into law by President Biden. And that would be a really good step in the right direction, it would be a strong first step. Um, and I think in the longer term, we can do a lot more at the federal level because as Representative Patterson mentioned, we do need a federal solution to some of these things um, just to make sure that all children are protected. And so um, I, I don't know if that fully answered your question, but that's kind of the federal landscape, if you will, is that these, these laws are very outdated and need to be um, reformed. And there are a lot of more uh, recent efforts to do so. Well, and, and to be clear, you know, I, I do believe that we need a federal solution, but the state of Texas is not going to wait. Um, we, um, you know, we are, like we do on so many issues where Texas leads the nation, uh, we hope that there is a, a government solution out of D.C. Um, personally, I don't have a lot of faith that anything's going to happen out of D.C. that's beneficial um, but uh, on any topic. But, um, but Texas is going to lead, and I think that Speaker Phelan's made that clear, uh, that it is going to be uh, the duty of the House this session to pass these strong protections for minors uh, and send it on its way over to the Senate and, uh, um, and then to the governor's desk. And one of the, you know, one of the problems, and I think why COPPA is in need of reform, in addition to all the things that, that Claire mentioned, is there, there is a preemption provision in there that says states can't act inconsistently with COPPA. And so that handcuffs the ability uh, of states to act in this space. So uh, just on that very issue, reforming COPPA would go a long way to, uh, to better keeping kids safe online. Um, and, there, and there used to be a federal requirement on protecting life. And uh, Texas led the way there as well, and then we had a Supreme Court case last year. So um, I would I would dare them to sue us uh, after this session. I'm sure the Attorney General would welcome that. Um, <laughs> so uh, so this is a question I want to uh, ask both of you. There's been threads of it um, kind of throughout the conversation, but uh, first, Representative Patterson, and we've talked about this before, but um, a couple of the you know sort of common concerns or criticisms people raise are that this isn't the role of government to legislate in this space. It takes away the power of parents. Um, some say that the platforms are taking affirmative steps uh, to better keep kids safe online. Um, uh, uh, Meta announced some updates this week, TikTok within the last few weeks, Instagram and Twitter have done it. So um, how would you respond to, to, to some of those uh, concerns? Well, I, I don't want to belittle uh, the work that the social media companies have done in the past, but uh, you know, really, there really hasn't been much done on this topic until we started talking about it. 
in fact, so little, uh, and we've seen so much disrespect from the social media companies that when the Texas House had our youth health and safety public hearings last session, not a single social media company even showed up to the hearing or met with us uh, dur as committee members uh, during that process. Instead, they sent a big uh, industry conglomerate uh, representatives there uh, who know nothing about uh, really what's going on internally. Um, I mean, we've seen the social media companies even lie before Congress about you know other topics. Um, but you know, these industry conglomerates couldn't even answer our questions. And in fact, uh, one of them uh, had such disrespect for the process in the Texas House uh, that they had the exact same talking points that they had laid out uh, to a similar committee just two years prior um, uh, to our committee hearing. And so the bottom line is, is that the social media companies don't care about our children. They don't. Their motivation is profit. Their motivation is greed. And their motivation is to hook their users, no matter what age, on their product for the longest period of time. And so Texas is going to act. Uh, we're going to act this year. I'm excited about it. I feel like we have momentum. Um, but we cannot rely on them. In fact, many of them haven't even met with me in my office uh, or many other legislators, even behind closed doors. I'm not even talking about like in a committee hearing where it's going to be publicly televised you know, on the state website, uh, but even behind closed doors. Now, they're starting to reach out now. Um, you know, we've, we've uh, met with TikTok and we will be meeting with Meta and, and others, but um, they're just not taking this issue seriously. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to trust them just like I'm not going to trust Congress. I, I have more faith in my colleagues in the Texas House and our leadership in the Texas House um, uh, where we have proven to, to aggressively go after issues such as these and protect children. And we're going to do that again this session. And uh, again, sort of threads of this have, have been uh, discussed before, but I want to sort of bounce the same question over to you, Claire. You, you wrote about, you've written about the issue a lot. You wrote about it in your, uh, in your American uh, conservative piece. And um, I want you to maybe walk through and address the argument that you've made in that piece in particular about why aren't parents enough uh, when it comes to social media. Yes, yeah, so this is a really important point. So, and I meant to mention this earlier when we were talking about COPPA. So even that low age of 13 isn't actually being effectively enforced. These companies are not being held accountable for this. And it's because of the liability standard in that law is extremely hard to prove in court that they had actual knowledge of a minor on their platform. And so we know nine to 12 year olds like are all over these platforms and they have no incentive to keep them off because as Representative Patterson mentioned, they want as, as many kids as young as possible to become hooked to their platform. And so the kind of de facto, because of the current state of our laws, has been the burden has rested solely on parents. And unfortunately, it's actually very difficult. Parents don't have full access or oversight or insight into what their kids are seeing or doing on these social media platforms. And, and the efforts that you know Meta has said that they've taken to make these platforms safer for children are just really uh, not... <laughs> are really not trying to actually do anything. It's kind of all talk, no action. They don't really give parents a lot of tools or authority over their kids' social media accounts. And so a public policy solution really is needed to empower parents to better protect their children. Um, part of this is also because social media creates what's called a network effect, which is that it really changes the entire social dynamic that these kids are living in. So even social media used by a few children in a school or organization changes the entire social atmosphere. And so even if a parent does everything to keep their child off social media, that child is still affected by it in that all their peers are on this all the time. They can still kind of feel affected by that isolation um, of not being part of what everyone is talking about. And so the network effect is a really damaging part of social media as well, and parents need help against that. And then the last thing I'll say is that more research has come out that there's really a screen time disparity that children in lower income families under $35,000 a year um, are on screens about two and a half hours uh, more per day than children from higher income families over, say, 100,000. And so kids of lower income families are on screens almost nine hours a day compared to more like six hours. And so 
I personally believe all children, regardless of what your family socioeconomic status, should be protected from these threats, not just um, kids from higher income, more educated families. And so where there's a lot of precedent where the state has recognized that something is so harmful to children like alcohol or tobacco or gambling or even driving a car that we say that children need to be more mature to be able to handle something like this. And we set an age limit for it. And that is to protect all children when we recognize for the common good, for the flourishing of those children and our entire society that we need to age restrict something. And so parents really aren't enough when it comes to the threats of social media. The, the state needs to step in. So I'm encouraged to hear about the efforts that Texas is doing in the meantime. They should absolutely not wait on Congress. And there's a lot that states can do. So it's really exciting to see that in Texas. Um, we are going to come back to Texas shortly, but Claire wanted to um, follow up with you, start uh, with you on this first, um, and Representative Patterson, feel free to, to chime in. But um, in addition to efforts that Texas is taking, there are other states. Uh, Utah has done bills like a filtering bill. Louisiana did an age verification for access to pornography. Could you talk uh, just a little bit about those issues and, and what other states are doing? And, and then you, you and Professor Kandu and others, you've written some things about, he, hey, here's there are some other things that, that states can do. Could you just touch on a few of those? Yes, absolutely. So um, I think Zach's mentioned, I released a report this past summer along with another organization, the Institute for Family Studies, and several of us collaborated on that to try to give some concrete policy ideas to states to say that we don't need to wait on Congress. There's things that is absolutely in the power of states to do to protect children online. Um, and one of the foremost of those being um, taking that kind of approach of contract law that we know that um, in contract law, it's normal if there's a minor entering a contract contract that parental consent should be required. And so it is strange that 13 year olds can just open a social media account without any parental consent. And that is as good as entering a contract, agreeing to those terms of service. And so Utah actually has recently passed uh, two social media bills, a house bill and a Senate bill that the governor intends to sign. And, and that they've taken that kind of parental consent approach, not as strong as a ban, um, but to try to say that if you're a minor under 18, creating a social media account, Account, you need to get parental consent, you need to verify your age, so they need to know if you are under 18, and then you need to provide that parental consent. And I think that would be a really great start, um, just so that parents actually have the power that, <laughs> that they can actually decide whether or not their child gets social media or not, and, and actually be able to effectively uh, monitor that. Part of the recent Utah bill also has an overnight ban for social media, so minor accounts can't um, access social media between 10.30 p.m. and 6.30 a.m. to try to address some of the sleep issues that you mentioned, Zach, that a lot of the dangerous stuff happening online tends to happen during those other night hours when children should be sleeping. Um, and uh, the last provision of that would also be to give parents full kind of administrative level access to be able to actually see all the direct messages or posts that their children are encountering online. Because currently, parents, if they're trying to protect their kids, even if they buy the best kind of private software available to enact time limits or monitor screen time and these things, don't often give full access into what their kids are seeing or doing, like direct messages or or even like TikTok, it's very difficult. Most parental tools can't access TikTok or see what's going on in that app. So um, those are some interesting aspects of the Utah social media bill. Um, and so those are kind of moving forward in Utah. And then you mentioned Louisiana actually had a bill go into effect, like uh, the law became effective January 1st of this year, requiring pornography websites, adult websites, basically any website that has more than a third of its content that would be uh, deemed pornographic in nature to uh, have to verify that the age of the user is over the age of 18. And so that's a really interesting approach. And I know other states are interested in kind of enacting a similar age verification requirement. And so there's a lot of encouraging things happening. You also mentioned Utah passed a device filter law, um, which hasn't gone into effect. They need, I think, five other states actually have to pass a similar law for it to go into effect. But then it would require any manufacturer of any electronic device in Utah would have to automatically enable a filter on like an iPad or a phone um, that would filter out pornographic content. Again, putting the defaults in place to filter out that type of content so children aren't coming across it. 
Um, yeah, so those are kind of efforts going on in, in other states. You know, just to add to that, it, it, it's so exciting to have our former government across the country because you have all these incubators all over the nation, um, you know, everybody with good ideas, you know, really trying to put them forward. We get to see what works. We get to see how this kind of flushes out. And then hopefully, you know, we can take the best ideas and keep improving on this. And so I'm so excited to hear about, you know, what some of these other states are doing. But you know, I want to be very clear because I think this was kind of glossed over by me earlier and it goes back to your previous question. But, you know, the technology is just so radically different because I've heard the argument that, um, oh, well, you know, they said the same thing about the television or, or what have you. But, you know, as you mentioned, the overnight hours, you know, in addition to sleep, um, you know, there are things that the FCC doesn't allow on the radio or on television at certain hours of the day because children are awake and could be watching it or listening to it on the radio. Uh, and so some of that material is reserved for later in the evening. Um, you know, but in social media, uh, there is no ratings, uh, you know, agency out there rating all these independent videos that are uploaded to the system or, or photographs or what have you. And there's no time restriction and there's no FCC guidelines on any of that. And so, you know, all this antiquated uh, protection for our children who used to watch TV uh, now they do everything online on, on social media or on YouTube kids or what have you, and none of those protections are in place. So we're really just at the whim of the social media companies, uh, and it's the Wild West. And so um, that, that's a big piece of this. So I'm, I'm excited to hear about what's happening in some of these other states. So uh, j just wanted to, uh, I think you covered, like these are policies that, that, are, that are out there, but that, uh, are already authored in Texas or will be coming soon, from my understanding. Yes. And um, one of those uh, that you mentioned uh, that was recently filed, HB 18, it was uh, it was highlighted as a as a speaker's priority. Um, and uh, if I if I'm remembering correctly from you know the comments and the press releases, uh, this and Representative Capriglione's bill on consumer data rights is. These are good starting points, and uh, so I'm encouraged that uh, as starting points, as as great of bills they are, maybe we'll we'll dive into uh, a couple of other things. Um, I'm new to Texas, and and I don't know how familiar everybody is with with how legislative sessions work, but we've been in this sort of first 60 days period. Uh, committee assignments are out. The session is starting to ramp up. If you could just talk through just sort of the legislative process, nuts and bolts, is what is uh, what is next with these bills? They get referred to committee, and then what happens? Yeah, well, you know, the brilliant um, idea that our founders had was that you know we believe in limited government. We believe that when the government is there crafting laws, that it's potentially very bad for everyone that has to live under those laws. And so our founders set up a form of government where Texas. Uh, can only, uh, you know, have a legislative session for five months every other year. Constitutionally, we have 140 days starting the second Tuesday in January straight, 140 days. So we end around the end of May. And so we have just 140 days to do all the business of 30 million Texans and the ninth largest economy in the world. But it's actually shorter than that because the first 60 days constitutionally, we can't even vote on bills the first 60 days. So, you know, then you're left with what, about 80 days and then the last couple of weeks are really dotting I's and crossing T's and trying to get things uh, that have passed both bodies uh, to get uh, completely on the same page uh, in terms of the, la uh, the language within the legislation. So we have a very, very limited time in Texas. Uh, we ha are about to hit the 60-day um, uh, mark, I believe, next week. Uh, where you can no longer file bills. So that first 60 days, we're organizing ourselves, we're filing legislation, we're getting into committees, we're getting the committee process starting. And then this is really where the rubber meets the road. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot of speaker priorities come out now, whether it be about social media or the other priorities you know, moving forward. But in the Texas House, what is unique is that you know the membership really sets the priorities and the tone uh, for what we're gonna do. And then uh, the speaker certainly has his uh, list of priorities as well, um, but you know the membership is really empowered uh, to to run the committees, to have autonomy, uh, to represent our districts, and to make sure that we're fighting for things that our people back home uh, want. And that's the way that Speaker Phelan has you know it set up. And so, uh, but these first 20 bill numbers uh, that the Speaker kind of keeps in reserve, and then a few other numbers like a House Bill 1000 or a House Bill 100 or what have you. 
that the speaker's team holds back, uh, those are given special placement to special bills that are of particular importance uh, to the speaker and to the body as a whole. And so that's how HB 18 got to be HB 18 and not HB you know, 1852 is because um, it is a major priority for the speaker and our team uh, in the Texas House. And so um, you know, these bills have to be heard in committee. Uh, they have to be voted out in committee. Every bill that goes through a committee and is voted out then goes through the calendars committee, which I serve. So that's kind of the funnel uh, that keeps bills before it goes onto the floor for a vote of the whole body. Uh, and then, of course, then it has to go over to the Senate, a very similar process there, and then ultimately to the governor's desk. And we only have about 80 days to do all of that uh, remaining. So there's a lot of work to do between now and then. And, and it does go to the to the beauty of the process. And I was a I was a former uh, I was a legislator in a former life, and you we're here talking about ideas, it, sort of in the abstract, but also hey, there's these real bills that are out there, and so it goes through the process, and you have to have this broad stakeholder discussion, and you get the perspective of child advocates, you get the perspective of uh, a therapist, psychologists, and the like. You do need the perspective of industry in all of this because it does fit into the broader framework. And, and it was a great uh, discussion. If you didn't uh, watch it, uh, we had a uh, consumer data uh, privacy panel yesterday that David hosted. And uh, Microsoft uh, was on the panel along with Representative Capriglione and Brianna Gordley, uh, one of our allies in this space. And uh, they covered really well the, the gamut of that. So uh, there's, there's a lot of movement and a lot of things uh, that can, can change and work to you know, improve and refine dot the I's and, and cross the T's uh, as we go. Um, two other points I just wanted to make and uh, that just sort of popped into my head uh, as we were uh, talking is, um, and HB 18 speaks to this, and, and so uh, COPPA, this federal law, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, requires verifiable parental consent. And uh, in the rule and frequently asked questions on the FTC's website, I have to go back and look, it's like 28, 38, 58, it's a very large number that ends in eight uh, ways that you can obtain verifiable parental consent. And so uh, the FTC uh, gives you a lot of ways, industry has a lot of ways to do it, and unfortunately we see that that's not really happening because you have uh, kids as young as eight and 10 that are using these products. I, I feel like I'm gonna take us down uh, back into the, the the, the icky mud again, um, but, it, but it is for a good point that you have kids that are younger than 13 using these products, and I would uh, venture to guess that uh, many of the, much of the psychological research on this is uh, kids at that age still have, aren't uh, fully developed uh, uh, mentally and in their capacity to, to use these things, um, but it's the verifiable parental consent piece that is, that is not really enforced uh, by the FTC, and a lot of people would say, well, the government enforces too many uh, things anyways, but there were, uh, under COPPA, the, uh, the fine is somewhere in the, the uh, four, it's like $43,000 or so, and up until a couple years ago, the largest fine levied against an online uh, uh, platform, uh, whatever uh, that they're called under, uh, under the law, was uh, somewhere in the ballpark of $5 million, and so you do the math out on that, and it's only a couple hundred violations, you know, that they're catching. Um, there's a lot more out there. Um, and HB 18 speaks to that piece and, 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 and sort of drives home the need to get actual verifiable parental consent. Uh, and so hopefully, uh, you know, that bill, those provisions can move forward and, and we can see that, that sort of carrot and stick, you know, that we talked about earlier, there's carrots. Uh, but also uh, we, can, uh, we can look at the stick. And then one other thing that I just wanted to mention, I, I don't know if it's, if it's been published yet, David, but um, myself and uh, my colleague, Melissa Ford, who, uh, who works on our Secure and Sovereign Texas campaign, uh, we wrote an op-ed on the impact uh, and the intersection of uh, human trafficking and the cartels and social media. And um, uh, they, they focused largely on their perspective from the sort of cartel perspective, and we focused it on sort of uh, the sort of the domestic and social media perspective. And um, there's uh, just some really, really sad stories out there. So the cartels are using social media to drive some of this content. This is another debate. These are things that were actually debated at the Supreme Court. The, the, the Twitter case, which was the case heard on Wednesday, was can a social media platform 
platform host and allow terrorists to be on their platform. That was the, that was the second case. And then the first case, uh, the Google v. Gonzalez case was, it goes to that algorithm piece is, so Section 230 says you have, uh, you, you have this sort of broad good faith uh, immunity to take down objectionable content. The question in that case is, well, what about algorithmically promoting uh, this content? And um, I promise I'll circle back to what I was actually going to talk about with uh, the cartel. So the cartels, they're using the platforms. They are, uh, they are hiring teenagers that come, come down to the border, pick up a car load, or we'll put some stuff in your vehicle, and uh, drive, it where we, drive it where we tell you. And so it's one of the means by which drugs are flowing through. Uh, but very, very disgustingly, it is a means by which people are being transported. And they're paying uh, teenagers uh, anywhere between maybe two and $3,000 per person that they traffic. Come pick, up, come pick them up at the border, drive them to wherever we tell you, and you, you pay some money. And um, much, uh, much like in, uh, in this space, the area of uh, you know, gangs and, uh, uh, and the like, um, once you're in, it's hard to get out. And uh, that's, a, that's a reality. Um, and I, I would mention one of your colleagues, Representative Campos, introduced a bill uh, that would prohibit social media companies from hosting uh, uh, prostitution, content and, uh, and uh, human trafficking content on there. So that's another example uh, of a bill that's out there. Um, and then, again, I don't want to take us down into the, the sick, disgusting weeds and end on such a sour note, but one of the things that we haven't discussed is what's called the blackout challenge. And uh, that is a challenge uh, predominantly on TikTok. And I would just say more broadly, challenges are, hey, here's some cool thing that kids are doing, do it. And uh, the blackout challenge is one of the really sad and egregious ones. And it is essentially uh, choke yourself almost to death and then do it again, and then do it again. And uh, there's a, an eight or nine-year-old girl, Lalani from North Texas, uh, that did that challenge, uh, and she, she strangled herself to death. And uh, an unfor the unfortunate reality, and this is where policymaking is needed, and we don't want policymaking through the courts, is uh, the families of folks that are impacted, uh, who are harmed, and, and even die uh, via these challenges have very little legal, legal recourse largely as a, as a function of Section 230. And this is where, in policymaking, you get into that balancing of that act of we, you don't want to open the floodgates uh, of litigation. Uh, and that is a reality. We don't want to litigate uh, you know, business and commerce out of existence. Uh, but at the same time, it is, there is a real harm and impact. And it, for, for, for victims and, and survivors to have little recourses, um, I would just say personally, I don't want to you know, necessarily speak for the foundation, but for me is, is, uh, is personally a little troubling. Um, I rambled can, can on. I, can I mention Please. something about that? So, <clears throat> you know, I've got a lot of statistics here about suicide, and I, and I want to read those before, before we conclude. But, you know, what happened to that little girl in North Texas, um, you know, that, that's not really suicide. I mean, she did not, um, you know, mean to take her own life. She, you know, this wasn't someone that was, you know, depressed or sad and, and decided to take her own life. She was tricked into taking her own life. And, you know, this is why, you know, her mother was, you know, asleep downstairs for a nap after a very long road trip. You know, they get home and the little girl goes upstairs and then, you know, the mom wakes up and, and uh, that's the situation. Uh, but you have to understand, our kids are killing themselves at a clip that we have never seen before in our society here in America. I mean, I'm talking about record numbers, and this is after a period of decline. Mm -hmm. So from like 2000 to 2007, there was a period of decline of, of self-harm and suicide rates amongst adolescents, okay? But what's happened since then, it's more than tripled. Um, there is something going on in society, and, and the stats that I have, these are all pre-COVID numbers, by the way. So we can't blame, oh, COVID, and they're away from their family and, or their friends, and they're, you know, they're not in the school environment or what have you. you know, suicide's the number two leading cause of death amongst young people. Number one is gun deaths. But a majority of the gun deaths are suicides amongst adolescents. Um, emergency room visits have doubled uh, for suicide attempts. Uh, so, and, and that's especially amongst young girls. You know, in 2019, the CDC noted that during 2018, approximately 95,000 youths from 14 to 8 year old, uh, 18 years old, visited the emergency departments for self-harm 
in suicide. I mean, we're seeing record percentage increases of our kids killing themselves. That's how important this issue is. And that's before you even get into the folks in society that have access to our children, that if you were walking down the sidewalk and were meeting this person, you would cross the street and go over. Those people that have access to our children through social media, and that's before you even get into the suicide numbers. So this could not be a more serious issue for the young people of our country. And my heart breaks for these folks that have lost their children through suicide or through uh, being tricked you know, into killing themselves. There's just, I can't imagine anything worse as a parent. Well, sorry to uh, uh, end us on such a dour note before we head over to Q&A. The last thing I wanted to ask you guys, if uh, people want to follow you and your work, where can they find you? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, you know, I'm uh, on social media. <laughs> the, uh, um, but here's the deal. You know, I wouldn't be if I wasn't in this position, I'll tell you that. But, you know, look, I have a website, jaredpatterson.net. Um, you know, we post a lot of our press releases there. Um, and uh, certainly the State House has a website where they post our, our press releases. Um, I've done a lot of media over the last year on this topic and others. Um, and then, um, you know, certainly across the social media platforms, uh, you can find me there. If you're an adult, uh, please follow me. If you're a child, please <laughs> don't uh, get off the, the platform. Um, but uh, absolutely. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, our website, our organization has a website, eppc.org, and you can find my scholar page there, which summarizes everything I've written um, or spoken about on these topics. And we also have a project page um, about the technology and human flourishing project where we've posted things like the report Zach mentioned for the ideas for states. We also have a parent's guide on technology to try to empower parents, um, which maybe this will come up in the Q&A, but I actually think there's a lot more I'd love to say about smartphones. Phones. And so that's something we talk about in the parent's guide, alternatives to smartphones, why kids should not have smartphones, because the combination of social media and smartphones is what makes it especially deadly. And then also um, have written about efforts states can take to combat obscenity online, protect kids from online pornography. So um, I also have a Twitter handle only because of my work. So <laughs> um, likewise, Claire Morell, EPPC on Twitter as well. And you can find more about us at texaspolicy.com. Uh, I don't use social media. When I got out of the Senate, I got rid of it. And uh, it was um, probably after uh, having, uh, marrying my wife and having kids, it was the third best decision that I made. Uh, either Tech Crunch or Tech Dirt, whoever that guy is, he uh, thought that was uh, pretty ridiculous. Uh, but anyways, we're going to now go to the question and answer uh, session. I believe Dustin has our mic in the back. Uh, we'll start right down here in the front row, and our two, uh, uh, three rules are ask a respectful question in less than a minute, and please end it with a question mark. <laughs> and upward inflection. Thank you both so much. Um, so what is annoying to me, I have a child that's 35 years old now, so I don't have the younger children, and, but we had some issues even back when he was in high school. But what annoys me is that TikTok does not provide the type of content to American children like they do in China for their children. And I wish there was a way that we could make TikTok provide the same type of information to American children as they do their own children. Is there a way to, I mean, modify content in regards to, I mean, why can they not, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander here, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. I just wish that we could do something to get them to not want to, you know, pollute our kids. They're not even doing it to their own. Mm -hmm. I can respond briefly. I wrote an op-ed on this last year. Very briefly, TikTok is by far the worst app, and part of the problem is it's owned by a Chinese company, and so they they don't even have to abide by American laws. And so I've written that 
our government should just outright ban TikTok. I think there's increasingly an effort to do so that's even bipartisan, not just because of the threat to children, but the national security threat that the Chinese is actually collecting data on Americans and children that can be used against us. And the inconsistency in the version in China that has overnight access banned, 40 minute time limit a day, the content is basically like I call the spinach version of the app, and then they export the digital fentanyl version to America's children um, should just and necessitate our government banning the app from doing business in the United States. Yeah, one of the bills that I filed this session, uh, following in, in the footsteps of, of uh, you know Governor Abbott's leadership on this issue, after Governor Abbott said, any state agency, any public university in the state of Texas, you will not allow TikTok on any device or any Wi-Fi signal. Uh, you've seen that play out in the university setting at the University of Texas, Texas A&M, and others. Um, uh, I filed the bill that says no social media apps from any bad state actor like Iran, China, Russia, North Korea. Uh, we've done that in other cases about connecting to our infrastructure uh, in the state of Texas. And so we're looking to do that this session uh, on any of these apps that are owned by any of those bad state actors. I was going to alternate sides of the room, but no one. Uh, we'll, we'll go right uh, back, two rows from the back in the pink. So what is like current online age verification looks like checking a box that says, yes, I'm 18 or over. So what are the, the logistics of making sure we can actually verify an age? Well, <clears throat> make no mistake, they have the technology to verify their age now. Uh, they have facial recognition, facial recognition technology. Uh, they know by your likes and your dislikes how old you are. They, they categorize everyone. They know more about you than you know about yourself. They know when you're happy. They know when you're sad. They know when you're hungry. <laughs> they know everything about you. Okay, so let's be very clear that they know the age of their users. There's no way that they don't. But having said that, so in the bill that I filed, uh, to say that, you know, would prohibit minors from having access to social media. We have a, a, a two-step process for ID verification, uh, just as you would have if you were walking into a liquor store or if you were voting in the state of Texas. You have to provide a photo ID, a government-issued photo ID that says your age, uh, among other things. And so um, you would have to upload that ID, plus you would have to have a photo of yourself holding the ID, um, that would be uploaded, they would verify your age, and then they would delete that content from their system. Um, those of us that have to advertise, which I don't anymore, um, I don't want to give them any more money than they already make off of me, um, but those uh, political candidates that advertise on social media already have to upload an ID front and back of our state-issued ID. We receive a card in the mail, a physical mailbox, uh, has to be there for them to mail you a card, you enter a code, and then basically you're set up to advertise. They already have a process in place to verify that users are real people and that they are who they say that they are. So it would just be expanding that process to everyone, to all users, to make sure that all users are you know, adults in, in the case of my legislation. And then I would just add under the, the Louisiana bill, uh, Louisiana Act 440, um, they provide two mechanisms. One is a state-issued ID, and then the other is any commercially reasonable means. Uh, and so there are third, third parties that provide these services to a, to a lot of companies uh, that have various ways of, of, uh, of age verification through those, through those other means. Uh, the gentleman in the front. Yeah, my name is Dave Zinker. I had a, a comment and a question. You know, number one, uh, Representative Patterson, you know, I hope that you do this with a, not with a scalpel, but with a meat cleaver. And it's like you were saying, Claire, you know, they've got, they've got mechanisms in place to identify folks and make everything a default. So, so even the telephone, you know, so a, a kiddo, a, you know, you can give a kiddo a burner phone if, if that's all, if that's all he needs. So everything is a default and don't be nice to these guys because like you said, they wouldn't even show up. Now, my question is, are you guys doing anything, I, I, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with chat GPT, and what my concern is with that is that's going to that's gonna be a diminishment of intellect across the board. I mean, these guys, you know, I could pass the, the bar exam with chat GPT, and I am stupid, so you, you, know, you, don't, you know, you don't want me as your attorney. So... <laughs> 
You're, you're not agreeing with me, are you? <laughs> so in any case, my question is, do you, uh, is, is there any consideration or concern at this time for those types of things on the horizon? Well, I'll say I have a lot of concerns about a lot of things, yeah. um, you know, right now in our society. You know, I think the hardest thing about being a legislator in 2023 America is writing down on paper what used to be common sense. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to get into all those issues uh, on this panel. But um, I have a lot of concerns. But, but, you know, let's be very clear about government. Government is slow. Um, typically, major change is not made. Typically, it is... Uh, a little more surgical than what uh, you know the activist in me would want, um, and government always lags technology and society. We're always playing catch up. It's very, very challenging for us to get out ahead on these things, and especially in a state like Texas, which I would not want it any other way, where we meet you know five months every other year. Um, there's a lot of technological changes that happen in that year and a half interim uh, when we're not in session, and so. Um, I'm very concerned about this issue. I don't know that uh, many of the things that ail us as a society, that there's truly a government solution to it. Um, you know, I think that uh, if I could encourage anyone in here or anyone watching online, that the number one thing that we could do is keep mom and dads together and have them love their children. And many of the things that ail us as a society would uh, be resolved uh, just from that. The gentleman in the back, I believe, Maroon. Color shirt. Hello, my name is uh, Noah Platt. I'm a Sumner Scholar from Shrine University. Um, I am 21, but my parents got it right. I wasn't allowed to have social media until I was 18. And I certainly um, realized the benefits to that, and I'm, I'm glad they made that decision. Uh, but I also know that my peers and, and kids are smart, and they're going to find a loophole, if at all possible. Um, in a world of VPNs um, and you just, just finding a way around anything. I mean, I have friends that, you know, watch anime using a VPN, so they're watching it from Japan. Um, in, a, in a world of, of VPNs being so easily accessible to young kids, um, is, is there a way to combat that without taking away other freedoms like data protection that VPNs actually provide? Because I, I assume we're not just going to ban VPNs altogether. Um, so I'm just wondering how, how y'all um, combat that issue, and I would love to hear specifically from, from Claire, although all of you are, are welcome to answer. <laughs> wow. Um, yes, I will first say I don't think there's a perfect solution in that people will find ways to get around things, but I think we have to start by just putting some serious restrictions in place, knowing that a lot of kids are accidentally coming across things um, and just providing the kind of age verification requirements would, I think, make it very difficult. I'm not sure a VPN solution could still get around like having to, well, maybe there would be ways. But I think that um, you have to start somewhere. And maybe it's not a perfect solution. But right now, a 13-year-old just checks a box and is instantly on social media. Um, I also, I, I think the public policy solutions we're proposing are not to take the place of parents, but to actually empower parents. So parents are also still always going to be on the front lines having to try to have these conversations with their children and trying to protect them in all these different ways. And so the state is not replacing parents. I think we recognize that with social media, there are for certain aspects of it that makes it very difficult for parents to be the ones having full authority to be able to shut these things down um, just by nature of the way that they work. And so I think it is, there's multiple kind of prongs to a solution where we want to both empower parents by requiring parental consent or that they have full administrator level access and requiring robust age verification or consent verification to really make it a much higher bar, much more difficult for kids to get access. Are there still technological ways they could get around it? I'm sure there are. And that just reinforces the need for parents to still very much be involved and engaged on the front lines. And I think um, you raise a great point, just how your parents raised you. And I think a lot of it is not just rules, parents putting in place, but actually having conversations constantly with their kids about these things and really fostering that relationship to explain why and what they're trying to protect them from. So um, there's no perfect solution, but there's a lot we can do and hopefully empower parents. And it goes exactly to what 
uh, Claire just mentioned, Representative Patterson mentioned uh, earlier, and it's how we conclude our research paper, is um, they're, they're loving, engaged parents uh, are going to be the most important uh, part of this. Um, one other piece uh, about the VPN. So I'm a political science major, went to law school, so uh, we need to talk about, you know, talk to data scientists about it. But one thing I've observed is, uh, in, I use a VPN, and um, for example, HBO Max uh, won't let me access it, or um, I tried to like rent a video from, from Amazon Prime. And so there could be the sort of the technological understanding by a, a, a service that you would be using a VPN that could factor into it, but the solution is most certainly not uh, getting rid of VPNs at all, because there are other you know, privacy benefits. Um, the a gal in the, the sparkly shirt. <laughs> My question is, first off, I'm technology challenged, okay? I'm older. I don't even know what that kid over there is talking about. I don't know what a VPN is, okay? But I have two grandsons, nine and four and a half. They get on their mom's phone when she's tied up with something, and they play games on it. What are they learning about my grandsons through them playing games? I, I'm very curious about that because I ask because my daughter has started limiting this because she noticed that my oldest grandson, when he's on their iPad or the phone for too long, his personality changes when he gets off. And she doesn't like that personality. And it takes him a while to kind of get back to normal. So I want to know what they're doing to these children. I, I really don't know. And I want you to tell me so I can tell my daughter. And then I can say it came from you and not me. And she will listen, OK? The, the short answer is that a lot of these games and apps are designed to exploit the vulnerabilities of children's brains. And so we know from like ages 8 to 12 that children's dopamine receptors are multiplying, which is actually it's a good thing because it helps them to be responsive to social rewards, which was you know, helps them actually form social relationships, social dynamics. But these social media apps and games are often hijacking the brain's normal dopamine reward system because the kind of things that these games and these apps provide is an overwhelming amount of dopamine to the brain. And then the brain can become habituated to that level of dopamine. And so then it just it really weakens their prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that is actually responsible for that self-control or impulse control to recognize, oh, I've been on this for too long. That we already know is not fully developed until the age of 25. And so all the more so um, is this amount of dopamine weakening that already not mature self-control mechanism. And so there's actually brain science behind how these um, apps and games are really exploiting the vulnerability of children's brains and really essentially rewiring them to respond to these types of apps and games so that they are different and they are affected by them even when they're not on the app. And so it is really important. Um, we can you know talk more offline about trying to keep children off of these completely until their brains can actually handle that type of um, engagement. So she just said a lot of really smart things that is 100% accurate. Uh, and I have something that's anecdotal that's, that's not as smart, but it's something to look out for. Um, you know, <clears throat> a lot of these games, if you don't buy the game and you download them for free, they come with ads, advertising, right? Uh, that's why they give it to you for free so that they can show the ads and, and, and get the money there. Nothing's free. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no such thing as a free lunch. So, um, so in these ads, right, uh, I was just... My daughter has an iPad, uh, you know, no social media or, or, you know, and it's, it's pretty well locked down, but, you know, she has some games on it. And one day we were walking by and there was an ad playing and it was not something that a child should see. Uh, it was very sexual in nature, um, you know, very little clothing on the animated people that were doing things. Um, and this was an advertisement on a game that anyone in their right mind would know that a child would be playing this game. And so we went down on lockdown even further after that because, like, you can't even trust uh, these companies to even allow kids' games to not have raunchy advertisement uh, on it that is inappropriate for children. And so um, there's 
everything's wrong with it. I mean, it's like, it's, it's hard to point to something and say, oh, that's the benefit of doing this. It's, it's, it's almost impossible. And then we're going to uh, go to the gal in the white shirt. This will uh, sadly be the last question. If I could just mention one last thing, uh, give a plug for David's panel yesterday was on data privacy. It largely focused on HB4, which is a consumer data privacy bill. The, the goal of that bill being let's give consumers more rights. And that is the knowledge of, the access to, an understanding of the data that's collected on you, where does it go, by whom is it being used, for what purpose is it being used. Uh, and that, that speaks to the consumer side. And HB 18 is what I call a digital bill of rights for minors. And that goes to being an extension. I think of it sort of as an extension of COPPA with some you know, nuances in there uh, as well, that it would give uh, minors and it would give parents those similar rights to know what data is being collected on them, how's it being used. And it's even tighter to say, you can't collect data on kids, period, or you can't collect kids, data on kids, comma, except, and it has a few exceptions in there which are, which are pretty limited. So um, having, and, and it goes to the broader point of educating parents, grandparents, uh, you know, possibly teachers, pastors, and kids on these things, that's a, that's a critical component of it, is just having the understanding and awareness. Um, we uh, will do one more question, uh, and then we'll go to lunch. Hi, my name is Daphne Orner. I'm from New Mexico. And what you're talking about to me is like, it's every state's issue. I don't know how you're, how do you address that? I, you know, how do you address that? And then my second question is, because I'm from New Mexico, I'm wondering if you'll take us back. <laughs> I'll answer the second one. We'd love to. <laughs> well, I think to your earlier point, um, we do need more states, I think, to try to be putting forward good solutions. Um, you know, the states were meant to be the laboratories of democracy. They were meant to test out ideas and then see what works well and then have that be replicated. And so, and I think then that also puts pressure on the federal government to act when they see all these states are doing this, this has worked well, we should actually step in and make this something that's nationally applied. The other thing I'll say is with these tech companies, they are like global multinational companies. And so if they have to abide by a law in Texas, it may affect how they do business elsewhere because are they really going to t spend the time and effort to have to comply with these Texas laws for just Texas residents in ways that they might as well just do that across the board. And so I do actually think one state could actually have a broader impact potentially just because of its nature of affecting a business model. All right. I always hate paying the person that keeps, uh, that is between you and lunch. Um, there were a lot more hands up than we had time for. And uh, please um, find ways to, to, to reach out to us and to connect more on this. Uh, Representative Patterson has legislation. He has, he has commentary. He's written on it. Claire is a prolific writer. Uh, and uh, she has a lot out there. And, and David and I have a few things out there, too, uh, between research and commentary. Uh, I want to thank everybody that was here in person, all of the friends uh, of ours that are watching online. As a reminder, uh, if you're an attorney and you want to keep your license, sign in for CLE credit in the back. And then... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then uh, or or pass the bar on Chat GTP. Yeah, I, uh, I submit all that CLE plus pass pass the bar with Chat GBD. Am I in? You're in. <laughs> uh, but um, yes. And uh, uh, Zlotnick Ballroom, 12:30. It is our closing keynote lunch, and it will be moderated by our uh, great TPPF uh, new member, the Honorable Myra Flores. Thanks, everybody.